This is Vicki Matranga of IHA's Educational Programming. Thank you for taking the time to learn with IHA today. We'll be hearing from Andrew Della Merced about direct-to-consumer shipping, why software efficiencies matter. But before we begin, a few notes. You can ask questions during the presentation and we'll take them at the end. Hover over the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and type in your questions. I'll be back after his presentation to engage Andrew in a conversation. This program is being recorded and will remain on our website, theinspiredhomeshow.com. Probably by uh, tomorrow, it will be available. As consumers, each of us probably has purchased many items from vendors we find online. Especially during the recent months, we have experienced the convenience and occasionally irritations with how we buy single items from many sources. The current environment has kept people at home, which has benefited home goods providers whose sales in many product categories have increased. Houseware suppliers face new challenges in managing data flow, inventory management, supply chains, manufacturing, and warehouse procedures. As online shopping becomes more and more popular, direct-to-consumer shipping is also steadily growing. But in order to keep up with the demands of retailers and the high volumes associated with DTC shipping, it's critical for housewares distributors to be able to efficiently process orders and get product out the door quickly. Aptian Apprise ERP, based in Pennsylvania, offers industry-specific enterprise resource planning that consumer goods importers and distributors need to run and grow their businesses. Aptian's software solutions fulfill core functions to save time and money. Its knowledgeable team works with consumer goods businesses to provide industry best, best recommendations based on their specific requirements and they are currently working with several IHA member companies to develop customized programs. <clears throat> Today, Andrew Della Merced, a Prize ERP Senior Solutions Consultant, speaks with us from Philadelphia. He has been with the company for more than 16 years. Andrew helps consumer goods distributors find the right software solutions to fit their business needs. Today, he outlines some best practice tips around areas such as data, electronic data interchange and pro warehouse processes that can help your organization be better prepared for the challenges that come with direct-to-consumer shipping and order processing. Andrew, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Vicki. And again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, as Vicki mentioned, I have been working with the Apprise ERP solution for the past 16 years. I've worked with uh, fellow houseware uh, companies, um, implement Apprise, um, implement best practices for um, order processing, warehouse, and, and all that fun stuff. So um, thank you for inviting me today, Vicki and team. Um, and let's go ahead and get started. So uh, we'll take a look at uh, today. Um, first, take a look at the changing consumer buying habits that uh, we're all seeing out there today, because that kind of feeds into some of the challenges uh, that we'll talk about um, in terms of drop shipping to consumers, and then the solutions that you want to make sure you look out for um, during your selection of, of your software. And then, as Vicki mentioned, towards the end, we'll have some time for some Q&A. Before I begin, um, I do want to talk about a little bit of the terminology that you're going to see um, as I go through my slides, as I, as I go through the presentations. Um, just something to keep in mind, because I am going to be shortening some of these things and acronyms, so it'd be good for you guys to understand that. Um, ERP um, stands for Enterprise Resource Planning. Um, it's basically a business application uh, that organizes all of your data and integrates that into one unified system. Uh, essentially, it's your single source of truth that provides you with all the visibility you need to run your business. Um, you have real-time insights as well as uh, supports for all your cross-functional business operations and all the process flows that go along with that. Uh, DTC, or you'll see D2C, uh, stands for direct-to-consumer. Uh, that's the process of shipping product directly to the end consumer, uh, and that could include consumer orders from your own 
a B2C or business to consumer storefront, uh, as well as fulfilling orders from e-commerce retailers such as walmart.com, wayfair.com, all the big dot-coms that are out there. Drop ship or drop shipping. Um, that's when the retailer transfers the customer's order for fulfillment by the wholesaler and distributor. So they're fulfilling the orders on behalf of the retailer. EDI, you'll see us mention this a lot during this presentation. It stands for Electronic Data Interchange. More on that uh, in a few slides later. And then WMS, which stands for Warehouse Management System. All right, so let's take a look at what's happening out there. Um, look at the drivers behind the changes that we're seeing in the marketplace. And uh, I'm sure you guys will all um, understand this because you're all consumers <laughs> like myself. Um, and the obvious contributor to the changes in the marketplace is going to be the rise of the digital economy. Um, and so there's a, a few factors that contribute to that. One very obvious one being online shopping has simplified uh, the buyer's journey. So it is very, very easy for us to buy at a click of a button and have it delivered right to our door. So big convenience factor there. Um, and as part of that, we are also experiencing uh, the need for immediate delivery. So, um, you know, the, the Amazon factor, I'll say, is what I've heard, um, you know, for them to be able to offer such a quick delivery and turnaround after you've purchased um, your goods online. Um, so we're seeing that pricing is not only the competitive advantage for some companies nowadays, um, being able to offer a short lead time um, is certainly um, getting up there. Uh, we're also seeing new consumer markets that are emerging and buying online due to our current situation of shelter in place. Um, you know, there's going to be, a, there's a demographic of people who are being forced to buy online um, that haven't done that before. Uh, and those that were doing so already, you know, they're just increasing that volume there. Um, recently, I've had to, you know, at the start of COVID, I had to train some of my older relatives in terms of how to, how to buy online and stuff like that. So they've never um, did that with a lot of cadence. And now they're, 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 that's their only option right now is, is to buy online and get it delivered. And then lastly, um, a factor that contributes to the rise of, of digital e-commerce is, is the decline of the tr traditional in-person retail store buying experience, which can be attributed to the growth in e-commerce. So before COVID, uh, retail e-commerce sales activity was increasing year after year, as you can see from this graph over here. Um, and even though the double digit growth is predicted to kind of continue upwards into the future, the coronavirus pandemic has only increased the need that retailers and distributors be present in the e-commerce space. So this data was collected um, before COVID. Um, so we're not really sure exactly what that, uh, that pandemic reflects on the impact of, of retailers. Although we do know a lot of them are closing their doors because they weren't marked as um, essential um, or they just didn't have enough revenue to keep their operations going. So there's a big unknown in terms of what the consumer buying habit will be um, and what that looks like post COVID. Um, you know, are we going to be out there visiting brick and mortar stores like we were before? Um, will customers have been, um, you know, become more comfortable with buying online and having products delivered, you know, right to their doors? I, the answer seems that that's, that's most likely going to happen. Um, so even though coronavirus has altered um, how consumers shop and buy, the truth is that the landscape has been changing for years before that. Um, as distributors of housewares and other consumer goods, if you're not in the e-commerce market now, you definitely want to begin to shift in that direction. Um, that's the way people are shopping, so you have to keep up with that demand or you know, ultimately risk, at, risk going out of business. Um, so there are purpose-built software solutions out there that you can utilize to help you effectively manage this e-commerce transition. Okay, so before we get into some of the challenges, I do wanna provide some metrics um, from a customer that I've actually worked with in the past um, who was heavy in drop shipping even before COVID. Um, and I've asked uh, to get some of their metrics and just wanted to kind of share with you so that you have some sort of insight of what this kind of looks like if you aren't already in that. 
um, they reported about a 20 to 30 percent growth year over year in drop ship orders. I mean, that's a pretty heavy growth. The slide before that showed about a 10 to 15 percent growth. This customer in particular, based on their product portfolio uh, and their activity in the marketplace, um, was seeing a 20 to 30 percent growth, which is, is pretty big growth. Um, they were seeing about 5,000 plus single parcel drop ship orders in a single day. That is a lot of volume of orders for a single day. Um, and saw about a million drop ship orders in about nine months. So this is kind of um, at the, the higher level um, spectrum of, of activity that, that uh, they saw, but um, they were reporting that even during COVID, um, a lot of the days looked like this. Uh, um, so they already in the drop ship space, they were able, because they had that process in place and the, the software tools in place, they're able to keep up with that high demand even during COVID. All right, so let's take a look at the challenges of drop shipping. I'm gonna outline three challenges uh, that's gonna be kind of the resonating theme across all the different areas that we'll be focusing on. Uh, one is the obvious, as you saw from the previous slide, is the increase in the order volume. Um, so we're talking about thousands and thousands of orders um, coming in, very, very small, tiny one-liner orders. If you're doing business with the big retailers, they are going to have a lot of requirements, um, headaches, I'll call it. Um, and you definitely want to be um, compliant in some of their requirements or else you just can't do business with them. And then just overall warehouse complexity. So the three things we're going to be focusing on in the next coming slides are going to address some of these challenges. Um, being able to provide and exchange information electronically and in real time, manage single parcel shipments efficiently and without capacity constraints, and then take a look at some other streamlining of processes outside of the uh, order processing, outside of the warehouse processing, things like demand, demand planning, and a few other things that I'll mention. All right. So let's take a look at a few things that you definitely want to be avoiding if you're doing any form of high volume direct to consumer shipping. Uh, the biggest heavy hitter is going to be manual data entry. That is going to be your crutch. Uh, so that's, you know, keying in data into a single system or between multiple systems. Uh, that could be your sales orders, uh, tracking information, updating inventory levels across different systems updating e-commerce product information. If you're doing that manually, obviously you're not being very efficient. So you wanna stay away from that. It's manual, it's time consuming. You need a human involved uh, to receive that information and then place it somewhere uh, that leads to high cost and, uh, and you're prone to mistakes. And that also kind of poses another challenge that we see um, and that's how to scale up. So. If you double the volume, for example, um, you are operating with, and you're operating with a manual process, you are increasing your staff to accommodate all that, all those orders that are coming in. Okay. Uh, data inaccuracy. Um, that could be as simple as miskeying information, but still, I mean, it is inaccurate and that's eventually gonna cause some downstream issues. Um, so for example, you could have a consumer that's upset because he didn't receive his tracking information or he did receive it, but it was, you know, had the wrong tracking information on it. Or you may have miskeyed the availability of an item on your website, maybe saying you had a thousand versus a hundred um, and then having a lot of disappointed customers because they thought it was gonna be available. Um, the manual data entry also leads to advancing orders, uh, delays in advancing orders. Uh, and that's in terms of both getting information into various systems and also getting product out the door. Um, add time to the overall process and both consumer and retailer demands, uh, you know, factoring all that in, you know, every minute is going to count when you're trying to get product out the door. Um, Consumers have an expectation of confirmation emails and shipping and tracking notices as soon as things are happening. The retailers have very specific requirements and standards, as I mentioned. Um, maybe they have a 24 to 48 hour confirmation requirement or even a 24 to 48 hour uh, 
requirement to ship those items out. Um, so those are things that they're going to make sure that you're compliant with. Um, if you're not compliant, and I'll talk about other things uh, in terms of compliancy later on, uh, if you're not compliant, you know, that usually means you're going to get charged back and you're going to get some fines and things like that. Um, obviously, you want to avoid those things. And um, if you do too much of those non-compliance um, activities, then that could potentially mean a loss of business with that trading partner or that retailer. All right. Um, multiple systems and integration issues. Uh, most distributors and importers um, have to rely on various systems. So they need an accounting uh, software so they can keep track of all the transactions and how that flows into, um, into their chart of accounts, into their general ledger. Um, they need to be able to process payables and accounts receivables and things like that. Uh, you've got the WMS or warehouse management system that does that takes care of the operations from shipping to receiving and, and all the stuff in between. Or maybe e-commerce platform for your own website is a separate um, system. And then as we'll get into more detail, uh, EDI document solutions, right? So most of the distribu distributors are, are needing all these different um, modules or systems um, and it needs to be able to be communicated easily. Right, so if you're not, then um, and it's not streamlined or automated, um, you're certainly going to have some some integration issues. So ultimately, we want to avoid all of these things as much as possible. Um, you want to eliminate um, antiquated multi-system environments. Uh, you want to be able to select an all-in-one ERP solution that has the information in one place. Um, and avoid any of these integration issues. So accounting, WMS, e-commerce, and, and such, those are all in one system versus having all these different um, systems outside of, outside of each other needing to talk to each other. So an ERP system is gonna work across all departments. It's gonna streamline your processes and it's gonna store all data for all the reporting and analysis you need after the fact. So here are just some bullet points um, that you wanna look out for for a single system slash all-in-one ERP. I've mentioned some of this already. So connectivity to an e-commerce platform. Um, if you do have multiple e-commerce platforms, you wanna make sure that that ERP, uh, one can support its own or has ways uh, to efficiently, effectively connect to those e-commerce platforms to avoid most of the things on the left-hand side. Again, manual data entry being one of them. Um, having built-in EDI and WMS or warehouse management systems capabilities. Um, and then this thing called API, which is, stands for application programming interface. Um, so there might be things that you have to have outside the system um, built uh, and have connected and having an ERP system that can support and has their own, what we call API for those on the call that are technical, uh, be able to kind of um, call these APIs so that we can run business logic and things like that. So for example, if you have an outside e-commerce uh, website that you're, you're hosting on your own, um, you could leverage an API so that it brings orders in automatically or pushes products, products or product availability to that platform automatically without having someone to uh, manually enter that data. Um, so make sure you look out for that. Um, providing accurate information, uh, sorry, in inventory availability uh, is very key, right? So your warehouse management has inventory tracking, but customer service uh, needs to be able to see what inventory is available as well. You wanna make sure that that's all in sync and all current. Um, the ability for validations, right? So if we are automating anything that's coming in, um, is it following the rules of pricing? Um, are the addresses correct? So these are things that you wanna make sure are caught up front versus kind of down the line. Um, a lot of the things that we see in the direct to consumer realm is you know, addresses not being filtered properly at the source of the website. So they eventually get to you, uh, you bring it down to the warehouse and ultimately at the point where the warehouse is ready to slap a label on it and ship it, the label errors out because the address is incorrect. Um, so you wanna have systems in place that does all of that checking kind of upfront. Um, and then other things like providing acknowledgements, um, being able to provide tracking information back to the consumer, uh, to the retailers is gonna be critical so that that 
uh, visibility into where the product is is very clear across the supply chain. And then last but not least, um, a favorite and important one is going to be that it is real time, right? So if you have all these separate systems, you're waiting for syncs to happen. If it's all in one place, what one person does in one module, it's, it's immediately in real time reflected in other areas uh, for other people to make decisions and act on. Okay. All right, so let me talk a little bit more about EDI. Um, so for those on the call who don't know, EDI stands for, again, Electronic Data Interchange. Um, so it takes the place of paper-based business exchanges, so no paper, and digitizes those communications. So all the communications are, are all electronic, all, all digital. Uh, there's a website um, called EDI Basics, and they actually define EDI as the computer-to-computer -computer exchange of business documents in a standard electronic format between business partners. So it replaces older communications like mail, fax, email with an electronic approach. Uh, so yes, email is digital, but uh, it requires a person to accept that email and actually do something with it. Uh, EDI is, uh, that information exchanges um, are processed through a computerized system. So uh, why is EDI a big thing? If you're doing any drop shipping for any of the big retailers, your target.coms, Walmart, Wayfair.coms, all those big retailer.coms, um, you know, EDI is the only option. They are not going to call you or email you or old school fax you, um, any of these orders. And in return, you're not gonna be sending, you know, paper documents out back to them in terms of invoices and things like that. Um, so that's the only way that they're going to communicate in terms of um, exchanging information. Um, and if you want to play in that field, you're going to have to get on with EDI. Um, so for those who are a little bit familiar, um, you know, that communication happens through what we call EDI forms or EDI documents. Um, some documents that are uh, very common are like the EDI 850 document. Uh, the EDI 846, 856, 810. So things, those are documents that communicate sales orders. Uh, so electronically getting orders into your system. 846 is uh, our inventory feed. So, hey retailer, here's how much that you have available to sell on your site uh, of, of these specific products. Um, 856 is being um, advanced shipping notification. So as soon as that product is out your door, you're telling the your retailer it's out the door, here's the tracking number, um, and all that kind of stuff. And finally, 810s um, are going to be your invoices that you send directly to them. So there's a whole slew of other EI forms out there. Those are the common ones. Um, but it, again, if you're doing business with these big retailers, you know, EDI is probably the only way to go. Okay, so how does built-in EDI help. And I guess that's the key thing is the word built-in because you're going to see a lot of um, EDI providers out there, uh, but they're not in your ERP. They're not fully integrated into your ERP. The information is not going to be real time. So as best as possible, you do want to find a solution where the EDI is built into the ERP. So all things are talking to each other in real time. There are processes built within the ERP to trigger documents to get sent or received uh, through EDI. Um, and if that's outside the system, you're, you're doing bolt-ons to accommodate for that. So the three things, as you can see on this slide, that's going to address um, yeah, um, EDI is going to be automation, validation, and accurate real-time data. Automation is your biggest benefit. Um, like I said, those 850 forms are going to automate those sales orders. So as soon as they push that out to you, uh, the system is going to be able to translate that and actually create an order into the system, eliminating the need uh, for any manual data entry. For validations, uh, you definitely want to make sure, as I mentioned before, that, the er that you validate any errors or exceptions so that users are quickly alerted and they can quickly resolve the issue. Um, things like um, send, you know, validating the order so that the order acknowledgements can get sent out to your trading partners, aka your retailers. Um, accurate real-time data, uh, the system is constantly providing you with the most recent information. Um, it's possible to communicate with training partners on what inventory is or is not available. 
I mean, all of this essentially boils down to one thing and that's efficiency. Uh, and the whole point, and that's the whole point of the ERP with the built-in EDI. Um, automation, validation, accurate real-time data, they're valuable components of the system. Um, importers and distributors want to be able to bring in as many orders as possible in very high volume while eliminating the risk of error. Uh, if there's errors, it's essential that the users are able to see that in real time, manage them quickly, and prevent similar problems from happening uh, kind of in the future. All right, so let me uh, step away from EDI and kind of move over to the warehouse side of things. Um, this is gonna be helpful for those who do manage their own warehouse. Um, so I'll talk about a few talking points that uh, you definitely wanna make sure you have within your ERP. And that's going to be uh, warehouse management system is built into the ERP. So you, recurring theme, as long as it's, if it's built in, if it's fully integrated into the ERP, uh, it's talking real time to everything else within the system and the processes are in place uh, to support all that. So it's all in one system. The orders are there, the inventory, all the processing is happening. Um, if it's not, then you're going to have integration issues uh, that leads to, you know, inaccuracies and inefficiencies. Uh, reduce touch points. And these are touch points that could be either physical touch points or system touch points. You basically want to be able to reduce the time it takes to pull product and pack each order out. Uh, so traditionally, before the whole D2C um, thing came into place, uh, my customers were very used to pulling full pallets, you know, shipping full or partial truck shipments and having that sent directly to the retailer's distribution center, the retailer's warehouses. Um, and, you know, that's as a vanilla as it got. But now we're talking about high volume, small orders that we have to fulfill. So take, for example, um, you have 20 sales orders in your system. Uh, you walk up and down the aisles, picking the product for each of those 20 orders individually. Um, and then for each of those orders, you're pulling the product, you're placing it, um, bringing it to a pack station. And then from there, each order is then packed and shipped one by one. Uh, sounds exhausting because it kind of is and it's very inefficient. Um, so what you wanna make sure is that the ERP can support multiple pick strategies. So rather than walk the aisles 20 times to pick those orders, uh, you can do a bulk pull. You walk down the aisle once and pull the product you need to fulfill those 20 orders. Or maybe you have a cart with you, and so not only are you picking the products across the 20 orders, you're also keeping them organized, maybe picking and packing uh, at the same time so that as you walk down the aisles and you pick the product, uh, you're placing that in a shippable carton. Uh, so that way, in the end, there's no repacking of the product that needs to take place. And I will say, you know, we are focusing on D2C, but um, aside from D2C, you want to make sure that that WMS can support other shipping flows, whatever they may be, full, full truckload shipments and things like that, because that still does exist today. All right, seamless parcel labels and paperwork, I think is the biggest headache that I've seen with a lot of my customers when it comes to integrating a, a great workflow for direct to consumer shipping. So with D2C, there's lots of rules and requirements as it pertains to labels and packing slips, especially with the large retailers. So one, you're gonna have to have all the third party um, small package carrier providers set up in your system. And along with that, each one needs to have all the different service levels. So you need to be able to support uh, ground shipments, home, residential, uh, next day, two day, all, the, all those uh, different service levels, um, um, you know, smart post, sure post, and, and things like that, uh, because all these retailers offer a wide variety of service levels or shipping uh, freight uh, for their websites. Um, some of these retailers also want you to ship on their behalf. So you're gonna to have to maintain for this trading partner or retailer what their shipping account information is for UPS, for, Wal uh, for FedEx, uh, for USPS, things like that. Um, you're gonna to have to maintain that in the system. And then further, some of them have actual special label requirements. So make sure that that UPS or FedEx label looks like it's coming from us. So that return address on that needs to look like it's coming from them. Make sure it looks like it's a prepaid uh, label coming from them and, and all that fun stuff. And on top of that, each of the training partners might require 
unique packing slip. So again, for target.com orders, make I need you to put a target.com packing slip looks like our packing slip into that package. Um, and if you can just imagine having multiple retailers you're working with, um, having a lot of different packing list format. So uh, lots of variables there that people have to address. Um, you want to avoid multiple systems, produce the labels and paperwork. You don't want to take one package, bring it to a station, figure out who the retailer is, put in the shipping address information just to get a label. You want that to work as efficiently as possible. Um, so uh, are you able to produce that label at the point you, you want them? So that's whether you're, you're bringing that parcel to a packet station, as soon as it's dropped there, here comes the labels, uh, or do you want that label uh, as, you're, as you're pulling those products uh, from the shelves, um, you definitely want to make sure you're selecting an ERP system that could support all the different flows that you might have for, for direct-to-consumer shipping. Uh, warehouse structure. So every warehouse is going to be different. Uh, I've not seen one warehouse look and, and flow exactly like another. Um, so what you want to make sure is that your ERP system is flexible uh, uh, to how your warehouse is set up. Um, being able to allow definitions for zones or areas and even bin locations and set up rules for how you wish uh, to operate. Um, users should have the ability uh, to apply the settings within each of those zones as it relates to things like inventory management, bulk picking, uh, staging, put away, receiving, replenishments, and all different types of picking scenarios that you might have across all the different uh, customers you're trying to uh, service. Uh, you have to have the ability to configure your warehouse workers so you can decide um, which workers should be active in what zone or what area of your warehouse um, and what operations specifically they're able to perform. Devices, um, so handheld devices, picking devices, things like that. Um, you know, that is going to eliminate any picking errors, right? Picking the wrong product, uh, having a device allows you to verify that you've pulled the right product via the UPC or a barcode on that and that you're at the right location within the warehouse. So the WMS is smart enough to tell you specifically where to go so you're not just pulling product from any, any location, right? Uh, so having a handheld will allow them to confirm where they are, uh, confirm that they've pulled the right product and shipped the right product out the door. It's also gonna give them the ability to track inventory in real time um, and be very accurate. So as I'm pulling whether it's a single item or even a pallet of items, if anyone needs to know where in the warehouse that is, um, you know, the handheld would be able to determine, is it on the person? Did they drop it into a staging, a shipping staging area? Uh, did they drop it into a pack station and things like that? Uh, Real-time visibility. So again, another recurring theme here, uh, customer service needs to know where the order is, right? Has it, has it been picked? Did they even start packing it? Um, was there a label generated for it? Has it shipped? Uh, and a lot of the questions also pertains to tracking information, right? So as soon as that label got generated, um, you know, they should be able to see tracking information. They should be able to relay that uh, to any of the customers that might be asking for it. And then just a general automation, uh, anything that you could try to automate within your warehouse, uh, you know, conveyor systems and things like that, make sure you have an ERP ERP system that can, um, can support some of the automations that you might have in mind. All right, so let's talk about, so we talked about um, the order processing, electronic, uh, you know, interchanges and things like that. Uh, we talked about the warehouse. And then lastly, we'll, let's take a look at streamlining um, other types of processes that you might want to factor in um, when you're looking for a solution here. Uh, one of the things that are that's you know very important to a lot of my customers is going to be demand planning, and that's forecasting inventory needs. Um, so you definitely want a system that uh, has some built-in tools to help you with what to buy and when to buy it. Um, so kind of smart enough to know and give you some buying recommendations. Uh, it should be able to factor things in, such as lead times on those products. 
uh, minimum order quantities, and also being able to manage customer forecasts. So if you're getting any forecasts from your customers, uh, being able to load that in so you can see what that looks like, uh, do comparisons with what the system might be forecasting with the algorithms that it has in place that you can select and configure on your own, uh, and maybe even point of sale data um, that you might be getting from your, from your customers. Credit card is another thing, uh, credit card automation. Uh, so that is the process of um, obtaining and processing credit card transactions. Uh, and there's kind of two folds to this. One, it's uh, being able to uh, capture um, credit card transactions during the order processing. Uh, so that means being able to um, do an authorization to make sure that all the information is legit and they do have funds in there to, um, being able to capture the funds at the time of shipping uh, and things like that. And, and one thing that you do definitely want to make sure is that there is some sort of PCI compliance there. We don't, you don't want an ERP system where you're housing all the credit card information. That's not good at all. Um, so definitely want to take a look at, at that. Um, and then you know, the other side of things, on the AR side of things, having some way to offer um, customers to pay invoices, let's say on a portal that, that automatically gets uploaded into your system so that you can see that it's been, at, that it's been paid. Uh, large remittance advice auto application. Um, and this is something I see a lot with the customers um, that do business with the big retailers. Um, like Wayfair or Bed Bath and Beyond and things like that. Uh, you know, we're talking about um, very large quantities of orders. So every order you receive from, let's say, Wayfair.com, that ultimately corresponds to um, a individual consumer that has placed an order. Uh, so you could get a few hundred orders a week, maybe even more than that, um, and that translates to a remitt remittance advice uh, to your AR staff. Uh, with a couple hundred lines of detail. Um, so you wanna be able to get that remittance advice uh, and those payment details into the system efficiently without having to go line by line to reconcile that. Uh, you don't want to have someone manually entering that into the system. Um, obviously that's gonna take up a lot of time and potential for error. So make sure that your ERP solution has a way to efficiently take that large volume of invoice payment and load it into your system. Uh, product information management. Uh, so as it pertains to uh, you know, your e-commerce uh, site, maybe your own or even the big retailers, uh, you definitely wanna make sure you have a place for the product attributes uh, that it can be stored in a centralized location uh, so that it can be communicated and shared electronically to, to anyone that needs it. And then lastly, uh, sales tax. So as housewares distributors in this e-commerce space, you are going to likely have uh, sales tax to worry about. Um, depending on the number of states in which you operate, um, there may be multiple rules and rates for which you have to comply. Uh, and these rules and rates uh, are likely to change over time. Uh, so make your life easier, streamline as much as possible in an all-in-one ERP. Uh, rather than using multiple systems to calculate the tax and the regulations and all the rules, uh, using a sy single system uh, where all your data lives, all the rules um, are maintained, um, is just going to make that information management just a lot easier. Okay, so um, I've talked about, uh, again, the, the three main things, um, being able to um, you know, effectively get orders into the system. And once they're in, you know, um, getting that shipped and processed to the warehouse um, and then some other um, things that you probably want to focus on or, or con um, consider when you're, when you're trying to find a solution, uh, an ERP solution for, for your business. So with that, um, I think we can um, open it up to some questions if there are any that, that have come in. Hi, Andrew, thank you. Um, thank you so much for that uh, uh, presentation packed with so much valuable and action directed information. Um, we do have a couple of questions. So um, one from the floor is, can multiple companies be handled 
without having to log in and log out uh, to switch, um, to switch um, companies um, for WMS and shipping. Did I get that right, I hope? Yeah, so I guess it depends on the ERP provider and I guess what you mean by multiple companies, but um, a, you, what you want to start to look out for is if you are doing multiple sites, so that's, that's a very common one that we see, so multiple warehouse, multiple sites, um, there is typically no need for the, to log out and back into the system, at least for, from the Apprise ERP standpoint. Uh, being able to maintain multiple locations, multiple companies within one system will alleviate the need for you to have to log out and log back in, uh, which could be a pain. Okay. Um, how long does it take to bring EDI online? Well, that is a good question. And uh, I think it, it I'm going to say it depends, right? So uh, every trading partner is going to be different. Um, one trading partner um, might only require um, a few forms. And uh, just to remind you of the forms I'm talking about, it might be an 850 for orders, 856 for advanced shipping notifications, and 810 for invoices. While another um, trading partner might have you know, eight or 10 or, or, or even more that they require that you do. So it really depends on what they're asking you to provide as a minimum requirement to do business with them. Uh, and so the process typically looks like having that communication, uh, with the buyer, with the, the trading partner, understanding what requirements are there, and then um, obtaining what we call EDI specification documents. So I did mention that EDI is a standard, but not every trading partner will will trans uh, transfer or translate the data in the same way. So in one area of the document, they it might be um, a different value than you might see in a different uh, trading partner. So, so every trading partner has their own specifications as to what data they are going to be get, providing in, in what area of the EDI document. So that's going to require what we call a, uh, some form of EDI mapping. Um, so there's a level of effort involved in doing that, testing internally uh, before you tell the trading partner, I'm ready to test with you. So every trading partner, when you're bringing EDI on, is going to require testing with them to make sure everything flows, that you're following their specs and that there's no issues there. Um, so there's that lead time. And then ultimately, you you then, uh, you know, if all is said, uh, said and done and, and well, uh, you would go ahead and uh, turn that on and be in production with that trading partner. So uh, I'll say it could take you know, a few weeks to a few months, depending on how responsive both sides are. Um, maybe even faster if it's if it's something very urgent. Okay. Um, the next question is, um, how does a company get up to speed and have specific knowledge um, that it will be needed to get involved with EDI? Um, so I'll say that if you are going to be doing EDI, um, you are going to need someone um, that has EDI knowledge. Um, so, um, you know, either hiring outside or um, you know, doing some training with your ERP provider. Um, if, if you are going to be managing your own EDI transactions, and just to let you know, in, in my space, in the Apprise world, um, we do offer a built-in EDI, um, and we give you the option for you to manage your own EDI or have our, our team do it. So we actually provide a managed EDI service, and that's something you might want to ask, uh, you know, whoever you're shopping around for uh, to see what their options are. So uh, I've had folks that had, um, has, uh, had EDI uh, analysts or, or people within their company space that was knowledgeable with EDI. So when they started to use a prize, it was, they were, you, they were talking apples to apples. They, they knew the EDI lingo and, and they were able to manage all that themselves, which is great. Uh, and then I, on the other side of things, I've had customers who did not have that resource and um, relied on us to provide uh, all the heavy lifting, doing the mapping, doing uh, the testing with the trading partner, doing the communications, and even being the day-to-day the -day ears and eyes in terms of making sure things are flowing. There's no errors and things like that. Uh, so it really depends, I guess, on what's on the table in terms of being offered. Um, but I will say that uh, you definitely want to, if you don't have an EDI resource, finding a solution that might be able to provide that for you uh, without having to, to have that cost of, of that extra headcount. 
Okay, um, something related to that is a question that um, I don't know if you can answer in this public forum or could take offline individually. Uh, the listener is asking, can you please suggest an EDI between SAP Business One and Shopify? Yes, and actually, uh, so um, I, no, <laughs> I, cannot, uh, I cannot make that recommendation only because I'm not familiar with any of those providers. Mm -hmm. um, so unfortunately, no, I can't, but I, I could recommend a prize <laughs> if you're looking into that because yeah. I, I know that space. So uh, unfortunately, I cannot make that recommendation. Okay, well then how about tips for selecting or finding an ERP? Oh, good question. So um, you definitely want to, so there's, there's a ton of ERP out there, right? And uh, two things you want to avoid. One, you, you want to avoid getting an ERP or finding an ERP that's very generic, that doesn't fit your industry fit your space. Um, and two, you, you want to you, you want to um, avoid ERPs that are focused on other industries. So, for example, uh, if you're not in the manuf heavy manufacturing space, or if you're not in the food space, don't find don't find an ERP for that. Right? Find an ERP that fits uh, your industry. If it's consumer goods distribution, consumer goods importing, you know, look into that, um, that area. Um, and I will also say that uh, take a look at where you are today in your current system and your current operations and really hammer out all the challenges that you're having. All the things that I talked about in terms of uh, separate systems and manual entries, how could you become more efficient? Kind of jot that down as your requirements of selecting an ERP. Um, I'll also say that then take it a step further and look at where you want to be in the future, right? You want to be able to select an ERP that can scale with you, uh, be able to support that because what you want to avoid is buying an ERP and then having to go to a, a, a different ERP just to support, uh, support your volume. Um, and in the process of selecting an ERP, I'll also say, you know, bring a lot of the questions to the table, um, you know, have them show you uh, how their how the application can address all of these challenges that you're having today uh, and things like that kind of don't hold back um, ERP is an investment. Um, so you definitely want to do your due diligence and making sure you select select the right one, you know. Okay, well, it doesn't appear that we have any more questions from the floor. I'll look one more time. No, nope, I don't see another question. So uh, thank you again, Andrew. This was very enlightening. Um, for our listeners, thank you for joining us. This program will be on our website so that you can revisit it and share the information with your colleagues. Keep in touch with Andrew at the email address and, and website on the screen, and he and his team will be happy to get acquainted. This is Vicki Matranga again saying thank you for joining us today. Our webinars appear under the Education tab at the inspiredhomeshow.com. We have hosted many excellent programs this season and we'll be taking the pace a little slower in August. Check back to our site to see notices of upcoming programs. Oh, wait a minute. It looked like something just came in on the website. Oh, <laughs> okay. I amend my, my statement earlier. Uh, last question to come in is what is the range and cost of VRP options? Sorry, I thought it was on mute there. Um, well, that that uh, that I don't have much visibility to. Uh, um, uh, it, it really depends. So you're you're going to see a lot of ERPs right now in in the um, cloud uh, offering in the SaaS offering. So that way you're paying um, a I'll say a monthly fee for that, or um, you might start you might still see some ERPs offer on premise in which you're paying for um, a perpetual license. Um, unfortunately, I, in, on my side of the business enterprise, I don't get involved with the numbers. Um, that's mostly the, the accountants there, but um, I might be able to maybe find out some ranges and maybe uh, provide it um, back to you or through, through IHA, through Vicky, if that's possible. I don't have the answer right now, unfortunately. Okay. Um, it, uh, it looks like some people are expecting uh, big costs from uh, 100000 to a $1 million. So uh, I guess they're just looking for a range. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, so then in that case, uh, we will close out then for today. And thank you for everyone. Thank you to the listeners and thank you to the Aptin team and, and Andrew especially for uh, sharing your expertise with us today. Um, back to our, our close, um, we've hosted many excellent programs and um, we're gonna be slowing down a bit for the rest of the summer. So please check back to our site for notices of upcoming programs. Thank you for everyone. Uh, thank you to everyone and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.